pleasure. Thank you for the honor of being the respondent today. I'm really grateful to Kristen and the organizing committee, uh, to everyone at MSU and beyond who's made this possible both this week and for many years. I have to say that you've really created a space that those of us who sort of started fighting these battles for more inclusive and equitable digital humanity spaces a really long time ago um, have could have only dreamed of at one point in our lives. So this symposium is a really special place in my heart. So it's my great honor to, to be here. And I'm delighted to be here with Elaine and then Maury as well. I'm grateful to them for their thought provoking uh, keynote. And since they're more interesting than I am, I'll keep my response brief so we can have a conversation instead. But I was, as I was listening to Elaine and Thamori's talks and reflecting on the vast range of presentations on the schedule for the symposium, I've had this sense that we're really now in the data moment of digital humanities. And I mean, really, we've always been in the data moment of digital humanities, but it's often been qualified with words like metadata or data set. And in some ways, I think that's because for those of us who work primarily with other humanists, our humanist colleagues can get a little squirrely when we start saying that literature, history, or art is also data, as if something of the human is lost when we put the word data into the equation. But on the contrary, we are actually the people who are prepared to reveal exactly where the human in data is. And humanity is all over data. I might be biased because I'm currently working on a book that's claiming that the history of data is the history of empire and vice versa, and that data has given humans tremendous power to dominate each other, to dominate land the environment, and our more than human kin, as well as tremendous power to resist domination. Uh, so maybe I'm seeing data everywhere uh, right now, but I actually don't think that's the case. But we only know that data is everywhere if we can see it and if we can make it legible. And we can be the ones who demonstrate that data is undeniably and very beautifully human and more than human as well. We have the tools to show the world that the humanity behind data is shaped by the multiple axes of identity, by race and caste, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, class, nationality, immigration status, and more. And all that is human about data is in relation uh, to all that is more than human about data as well. And that's really what our brilliant keynotes have shown us in their talks at this conference, at this symposium. We heard Elaine talking about the ways that cultivars help us see the, the multiplicity and the plurality of the world. In Elaine's analysis, we can see the datafication of rice and how datafication, along with other processes, incorporates it into a complete assemblage of the economic, the digital, the political, and the economic life worlds that we inhabit. This is very much where the human and, and more than human intersect, not only with each other, but also with the very data that can be both a source of power and a site of resistance. I don't know if any of you are gonna ever look at a grain of rice the same way again. Uh, I know I won't. So I think I'll be thinking about Elaine every day because <laughs> big rice eater over here. <laughs> When we hear of then Maury talking about what data tells us about the prevalence of caste apartheid in the US and specifically also in big tech in the US, we understand data's power to hide and to reveal. 
we understand its power to continue upholding the inequitable power dynamics that have shaped our world or the power to actively confront them. Without the crucial work that the Mori and the Equality Lab have done to unveil the operations of Brahminical supremacy in, in the US and in big tech, we wouldn't have this powerful tool to prove that it exists, which is the first step to identifying how to dismantle it. I know that many of you have probably heard me speak before, and you know that I usually bring a weird mix of doom and gloom and unbridled optimism. I can't help it. I am one of those people born in that weird time between Gen X and millennials. So everything is awful, but also we can change things. So if there's any space that we can intervene as digital humanists, it's through our attention to data. Whether it's the metadata that we create for digital archives and finding ways to resist the erasure of histories and of narratives by pushing back against standardization in data that can be complicit with upholding power. Or developing new methods and new tools that allow us to mediate between those standards that make data interoperable and machine readable and the particularities of data from marginalized and minoritized communities. Our intervention may be recognizing that the predisposition between uh, the predisposition towards openness, open data, open access to knowledge is actually a reflection of the epistemologies of the white dominant cultures of the global north and that communities and cultures throughout the world have their own protocols and their own standards for data that must be respected and that are inherently valuable as well. Or perhaps our intervention is recognizing that knowledge of data doesn't only exist in universities or doesn't only exist in big tech companies, that people, communities, possess this tremendous knowledge about data and their own data specifically, um, and that it's crucial that we uphold their data sovereignty, their ability to control access uh, and production dissemination of their own data. Or our intervention may be at the level of data literacy, which is sorely needed to combat so much of the disinformation and hatred and ignorance that is for those of us in the US, certainly very much present in contemporary discourse. There is so much work to do, but we are the ones who are perfectly situated to do it, to demonstrate the power of digital humanities that lies at the intersections of that nebulous space where the human and data intersect, a space that we are charged with defining and uncovering. I'm really grateful that Elaine and Themori have shared with us their understanding of the power of data in their own work. I'm very excited to be in conversation with them today. So I'd like to begin, <laughs> I'd like to stop talking now, and I'd like to begin uh, with our conversation. And I'm interested, Themori and Elaine, about the origin stories behind your work. I'm sort of curious, and I know our colleagues would really be interested to know, how did you come to uh, this work that you're doing that's so incredibly important? Uh, <clears throat> well, I can kick us off. Um, so I think that I came to this work because I was oppressed and I wanted to heal <laughs> and be free. <laughs> it's quite simple actually, but I think the articulation of that changed over the, the, the breadth of my life, you know, and the kinds of tools I was able to access as I had language for my system of exclusion. Cause that is one of the tremendous things about caste is that South Asians are robbed of the ability to have 
you know, proper discourse that's rooted in acknowledging how vast the harm is and um, what we survived from it. So as someone who grew up in the diaspora, I watched my family suffer with caste and, you know, they had nightmares and panic attacks. They lived in the closet. And as a child, you know, you're watching South Asian families hide it, you know, and then they think if you don't speak about it, it goes away, but in fact, it's everywhere around you. And so I think my journey for knowledge was really a journey to, you know, heal myself and my family. And when I got to university, it was very apparent that there was a taboo about talking about caste there um, that had to be broken. And that's one of the reasons why I came out. And feminist intersectional um, racial justice scholars supported me in my, my work, um, whereas I didn't get a lot of support from South Asian studies at that time. And so I'm really grateful for feminist intersectional practice for that work. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Tanmuri and Rupika. Um, it's been um, uh, it's been really wonderful listening to you this morning. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so my story, I think, starts by accident. Uh, I grew up in the Philippines, uh, happened to be in the Philippines, uh, and a friend of mine said, uh, "You know, have you ever been to the mountain provinces in northern Philippines where?" Uh, you know, it's a very famous, these are really kind of, you've probably seen some of these photographs of kind of these majestic rice fields. I had never been, um, you know, rural uh, countryside fields were just not part of my city life. I grew up in Manila, big city, um, mega city. Um, so happened to get on the bus. It's a really difficult journey. It's about 10 hours long. Um, and come out of the bus and suddenly see I'm in a multi-species world. Um, the question then became, uh, there are these vast mountain ranges that are covered in rice terraces and uh, the farmers are incredibly impoverished. Um, many of them are migrating to look for jobs elsewhere. Um, and it struck me as, you know, crazy, insane, uh, that we're looking for uh, transgenic uh, crops when uh, mountain sides that are, you know, covered with rice fields that don't depend on any kind of electricity uh, have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, and why, why is this the case, right? So the question became, um, why do we have this uh, disparity between uh, farmer land races and multi-species ecologies. And on the other side, we have transgenics and monocrops uh, that dominate much of the world's um, uh, lands. So after that, I just started following seeds, um, just to make the long, long, long story short. Um, the Philippines also happens to be uh, the, the place where uh, the largest rice research institute was uh, open. I talked about it in, in, the, uh, in my talk. It's uh, the International Rice Research Institute. So it became very important to look at the relationship between these two um, very different uh, locations, but also entirely different uh, cosmologies, right? Um, why we're in uh, crises of food, but also crises of Western patriarchal capitalist modernity um, and all the very different kinds of lives that are caught in between. Um, so the project became trying to understand that. That's fantastic. I'm really struck listening to you both that my, my own answer is actually somewhere between the two, which is sort of happening upon you know, a weird folder in an archive on the Black Panther Party that said information about our paper and sort of seeing subscriber roles of the Black Panther newspaper, which made me think of maps, which solved a problem I had in terms of how do we think about global solidarity um, and how do we write about global solidarity. Um, but the very reason I was interested in it was that I was really struck growing up in the U.S. by the ways that South Asians embraced anti-Blackness. And I didn't really understand. I didn't, I mean, obviously I understood why, right? But I did not personally sort of understand um, 
kind of why you would do that as opposed to think about solidarity and that our collective our collective well-being um, can only be measured by how the most vulnerable communities are doing. And of course, indigenous communities in the US as well. Um, having listened uh, to both of your talks, I'm really struck by the ways that creative practice, creative praxis is part of both of, of your work. Elaine, you spoke to it directly. The Maury, I know that you didn't talk about your work as an artist in your talk, but it would be great to hear hear more about that. Um, I I usually don't feel very creative in the sense that I am not, I do not, I'm not an artist. I don't have artistic skills, I guess. Um, but what really resonated with me was this idea that creative practice isn't just about presentation or display of information, but it's really a method of, of, of inquiry. Um, which resonates really with, with sort of how I think about digital humanities, because for me, I mean, sure, the project itself, the data visualization, the digital exhibit, you know, is, is a creative outcome, but really um, it's what happens before we even get to that point where sort of creative praxis is, is needed when you're working outside what is sort of the traditional methodology of an academic discipline. If you're, I'm, my background's in English, we have historians, um, art history, philosophers. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what is the role of creative practice in, in your research and, and what does that look like for you? How does it inform your research even if it's not directly related? Well, <clears throat> you know, I think that one of the things I have written about quite extensively is that I identify as a socially engaged artist. And so I think that there are ways, both in terms of process and the product, that you see transformation, especially with community collaborators around work that um, is collectively owned or curated with the community that you're working with. And for me, being an artist is, is very personal because, you know, my, my cast is a performance cast. We're known as the buddy and cast after the drum, the cow drum that we play. And because it was made of um, uh, cow flesh, that's why we were polluted. But actually the drum itself is a semiotic communicator because different rhythms communicated different things about village life, whether there was a death or an important announcement of the king. And in many ways, the drum became a portal between life and death. And I think always as <clears throat> a young person, I was always drawn to communicating my experience around caste through art because it was a container large enough to contain both the grief and the intensity of what it was to be a survivor of religious abuse. Because, you know, when you're thinking about what it means to be from a system that says that you're not spiritually valuable like other people, your connection to the divine is broken. And art is also one of those things that connects it. That's exactly why people hire buddy ends to play at certain elements. And so I had to, you know, my arts practice, whether it was in music or in film or, um, you know, creative works of art with performance, were always about ritual making at that point of violence. Because if violence breaks meaning, creating art at that point of violence can reassert consent and reassert different opportunities for us to create a narrative that heals. And um, so for me, you like a lot of the challenge with caste was actually building bridges of empathy to this very far away system that people didn't understand, that also had words that weren't in English, so it was also super complicated, and around which there was tons of disinformation before people even used the word disinformation around. And I think art and storytelling really just cuts through all that miasma because the shortest distance between two people is a story. And when you move, uh, a, you've already moved the most difficult part of the mountain related to social change because people can have empathy for those that they didn't even know were embodied before. So I think that, that the, the usage of art as both inquiry in terms of process and product is so 
um, important, I think, especially for aspects of the digital humanities that feel far away from communities that aren't as well realized in the digital space, because it allows us to have equity in terms of the table of the conversation, because all of us have hearts, all of us have imaginations, all of us know that, you know, in many ways, a lot of the visions of the technological landscapes that we're in are nightmare landscapes because of the white cis men and their lack of competency with the rest of the world um, in terms of creating tools that reflect their values. But I think that if we can use our imaginary to also think about limitless feminist futures, there's a lot in that imaginary that we might be able to open up. I'll just build on the drums. Um, so I'm quite interested in the question of who, who has voice, right? Who has the right to speak? Um, and how might we as artists and researchers and activists uh, learn to listen to those voices uh, that might not come across as uh, texts written in a book? Um, so many, uh, Farming groups uh, rely on oral histories, um, rely on the sense of smell, sense of touch. Um, uh, rice fields are full of multi-species voices, uh, knowing uh, when birds are going to come or uh, insects are around or when, you know, the winds are blowing in certain ways. These are kinds of multi-sensorial, um, uh, let's say, engagements that uh, we need. Um, thinking about the drum that Tanmori um, mentioned, the drum in uh, plantations in the South uh, of enslaved peoples were the voice of resistance, right? They couldn't, um, they couldn't um, voice their uh, refusal um, by speaking in English. And so the drum and the dance was a way of establishing their presence um, without being, you know, br brutally punished. Um, and so the drum becomes uh, a kind of, um, how to say, uh, for lack of a better word, it becomes the stand-in for a presence that, uh, can survive this kind of extreme brutality uh, because of radical hope. Mm -hmm. um, and so creative practice for me is a way of uh, connecting to kind of those um, multi-sensorial futures uh, that we really need. Um, the other part of creative practice that's important to me is um, we're locked and we're speaking, we're speaking in English right now, right? We're, we're, you know, we're kind of disciplined into certain ways of life. And um, creative practice is a way of imagining different kinds of logics. Um, how do we emerge from these legacies we all inherit? Um, we're all part of settler colonial legacies. We're all part of uh, great violences. Um, and so creative practice is also a way of stepping out of that, a way of imagining um, how we might craft new kinds of socialities that have not been there before, right? I don't necessarily think we can go back. Um, and so it's not a call for return to traditional or land races, right? We've got to imagine kind of these cyborg and hybrid uh, futures. And so creative practice is really important to, I think, doing that kind of work. Thank you. My mind is now going off in about 15 different directions. So I'm gonna try with two. The first is thinking about what both of you were saying. I was remembering the first chapter in the Digital Black Atlantic, which is a book in the debates in the digital humanities series that Kelly Baker Josephs and I co-edited, that's about the Sankofa principle and really links the drum to the digital as a as a black diaspora practice. And so I was very much thinking of that as as you are speaking. I think the other question that I, that I comes out of what you were just saying is really around this sort of 
struggle, I think, in universities today around the ethics of community engagement. Uh, this is something that I'm really deeply invested in because I see a lot of potential in you know, the way we can think about redistributing resources that are concentrated in, in universities, but so often universities' relationships to communities are extractive ones, whether it's at the level of the, the independent researcher who drops in parachutes into the community and steals their knowledge and takes it back and leaves them wondering why they invited them to be part of, of conversations in the first place, um, or, you know, the university using um, community engagement as a photo op. And, you know, certainly a lot of universities are rebranding themselves as the engaged university and the community engaged university. Um, you know, I know we know that's not community engagement universities is not new. It's something that Indigenous people, people of color have been doing in universities from the minute we were allowed in universities. <laughs> but I'm sort of curious about what are, you know, what advice would you have um, for digital humanities researchers interested in, in community engaged work, what are some of the ethics uh, or values that you think are important for them to, to embrace for their work? Well, I think a big part of it has to be about the ways that people are building consent and intellectual property in terms of the sharing of co-design projects and models, because one of the challenges I've seen, particularly with um, <clears throat> Dalit and Adivasi community members, is that we are studied, but we are not seen as co-creators of knowledge that are based on our bodies, our lineages, and our histories. And this is a long-standing phenomenon we've seen with other oppressed people, but it's particularly egregious with caste oppressed people because caste is not visible to the academy. But like two examples that I can give just from the entertainment world is, you know, just yesterday with the Oscars, we saw that one of the, the Oscar for the best documentary went to upper caste filmmakers who documented um, indigenous um, uh, creators. And then the year before there was writing with fire, again, upper caste filmmakers do documenting Dalit journalists and the idea of co-sharing who is a producer as opposed to who is a subject is very much really present for the epistemic injustice at the heart of so many academic and um, community collaborations and with cast there is an overwhelming number of dominant cast tenured professors and probably only two or three Dalit professors in the academy um, so we don't have parity in terms of representation that could ensure a little bit more equity around those issues and the the systemic problem that results of that is that people may be hungry for documentation, they may be hungry for data, but the power imbalance really, you know, still creates a, an obscured version, a, an obscured data portrait, if you will, um, of our community. So I think there has to be room for really honest collaborations of what previous harm has occurred, you know, consent at the point of origin, and also abilities for communities to re-engage the conversation of consent um, later on in the process, particularly if something changes in terms of safety. And that is something I think for many people who are working around South Asian context may not be aware of, but many South Asians, because of the genocidal projects that are occurring in our homelands and the destabilization of democracies, um, people may consent at a time when things feel a lot more open and then conditions in the state might shift. And then all of a sudden you have to re-engage the issues of consent um, around particular projects, especially if they're around live wire issues. So I think that you've got to kind of name consent, name, you know, and, and share collective um, uh, IP so that there can be an opening up of the authorial position, you know? So it's not like research or subject, but something a little bit more parody. And I think we see some of the best guidance of this coming out of indigenous research methodologies that have a totally different shift of understanding knowledge production and, and especially across different worldviews. Yeah, just to add to that, I really like what you said earlier, Rupika, about metadata. And um, so it made me think about um, 
uh, how metadata comes to classify uh, particular subjects in ways that are invisible, right? And um, how do we imagine metadata uh, that actually affords different subjects the right to live and die on their own terms? Um, I'm quite interested in uh, uh, I think co-authorship is one for sure. I think as, as Ted Mori mentioned, um, but I'm also quite interested in um, how might we rethink uh, what even can classify certain kinds of data types. Um, you know, I think very much about double violence, and that means um, there is the original violence of settler colonialism um, that erases and exterminates. Uh, but then there's the double violence of then recovering those erasures, making them visible in ways that eliminate people's right or subjects right to complex personhood, right? That um, uh, enslaved peoples are not just enslaved peoples, right? There are the drums that are their voices of radically different futures. And so how do we establish metadata that allows for that? that allows for complexities, um, that allows for kind of these reductions that were put in place by colonialism or ongoing because of capitalism or even communist capitalism. Um, how do we rethink those uh, so that we have, uh, instead of monoculture metadata, how do we have polycultures? that allow for difference, um, again, you know, to stand on their own terms. I think that digital humanities, um, because of its flexibility, because they're procedural, um, let's say, uh, programs uh, that can flex, right, depending on what we're finding, how different collaborators are, doing certain kinds of research, um, how might we use those to, you know, rethink what even counts as metadata? Um, how do we rethink language and semiotics? Um, I love that's a that. huge question. That's super interesting. But no, I love that because I think when you put together, Elaine, what you're saying about metadata and the more what you're saying about co-creation, co-construction of knowledge and consent, I think that's really where we see that regenerative space of potential repair that is so necessary precisely because of so much violence that knowledge production has enacted on, on minoritized communities. I think that's really, really powerful for me. I'm thinking about the work that, that we can do, those of us who identify as digital humanists or not, um, at these intersections of the digital and the human and the socio-technical. Um, I know I'm sort of like my, my, my mind, I'm, I'm sort of without words right now, even though I have a whole list of questions in front of me because. I mean, I just, one kind of, you know, really simplistic example probably is, um, so rice varieties tend to be classified as either traditional or modern. That's kind of mind blowing, right? Why, why are farmer land races considered traditional? And why are, you know, kind of these hybrid fertilizer dependent crops considered modern? Those kinds of classifications give the keys to the future to the ones called modern. And so you have development organizations and agencies um, that suddenly cannot think of future food solutions that don't depend on modern varieties, right? But you actually have traditionals that have been around for hundreds of years and have co-evolved um, certain, certain kinds of socialities that we really need. And so you kind of, that's just a, you know, there, there are tons of other kind of more complex 
uh, examples, but here's a really basic um, classification that's just like, we, we need to change that, right? What is traditional versus what is um, modern? And that um, structures agriculture today. That's huge. That is huge implications around, you know, many different uh, continents. Yeah, absolutely. You know, something I've been working on is a project lately related to um, the data of, from Pan-Africanist events from the first half of the 20th century. And, you know, one of the things that happens when you're working with data of Black, the Black diaspora, and then also oh, some of this is Afro-Asian Afro-Asian solidarity events too, is that all of a sudden everything you're taught about data and how it should work um, goes out the window because you are confronted with particularities of the data set that, you know, somebody dealing with 19th century white British people doesn't really have to deal with. And then suddenly that then becomes a sort of space of how, you know, we don't want to just try and, um, square peg our data into the round holes that have been prescribed, but rather now suddenly we're thinking about what kind of, uh, what kind of technological interventions can we develop that can make this data usable and machine readable and interoperable without sacrificing that um, particularity or, or flattening it or reducing it to something that fits into a system that's been created uh, not by the people whose data is being ingested into the system. And we've been thinking about Wikidata, linked open data as potentially a way of, of dealing with that as a, a sort of a, a technical answer. But it's it's very much, I think, what you're both suggesting is the need to sort of open up these spaces for this way of reimagining what we even presume to be the basis of cultural heritage in its many forms, for sure. Um, it also feels like, you know, what Elaine is saying about <clears throat> questioning what is modern is really important because for me, it like brought up this feeling of like deep distastefulness because I feel like there's such violence about how he has been weaponized by both colonial and Brahminical standards in the South Asian context. And, and I, you know, I just remember in my own journey as a community-based researcher, you know, I talked, you know, and I'm sure this has happened to many oppressed people where you can show literally the dead bodies of your people. You can show anecdotal stories of discrimination, but that doesn't matter for policymakers, it's only if you quantified your suffering into quantifiable data that all of a sudden it matters. So the modernity and the kind of like scientific frame around, um, you know, how we kind of qualify our experiences is actually so detrimental to the worldviews and knowledge making of so many peoples. And scrunch all of that thing. And, and then even, even if you fit all of those things, <clears throat> you know, a fact is a fact, not just because of evidence, but because of power. So even if you fit that that little small narrow thing and you create a data set, you still have to fight for that data to be recognized. And that's something <clears throat> in Equality Labs we face all the time because we created um, that first data set that documents cast in the diaspora at a time when very few people wanted to do it. And there was a lot of violence to be able to do that documentation. And relentlessly, every day, there are articles that try to talk about us being connected to terrorism that, you know, I think there was one article that said I was the equivalent of a cast depressed Rachel Dole is all. It's whatever insinuation, whatever violence to try to erode what does it mean to be a knowledge maker from a caste oppressed background? So, you know, modernity is really not only in the, the eye of the beholder, but it's really in the, the power of capital, in the power of white supremacy, and then the, the power of Brahminism. And so for us to create a digital humanities practice that really creates parity and understands intergenerational harm, we have to understand that some data sets will always be contested. 
And what do we do to really inherently build enough flanking so that this consensed upon truth through scientific methods, whatever the scientific frame is being used here, is held and protected by the field uh, because it is a tremendous battle for truth that we're also engaged in as we deal with repair, as we acknowledge historical harm. Not everybody wants to do that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think about how what you were just describing in your experience with the Quality Lab is so reflective of the experience of people who work in, say, ethnic studies and ethnic studies fields like Black studies, Asian American, uh, Latinx, and Native American Indigenous studies within the academy, where we're constantly fighting these battles for the legitimacy of the knowledge that we produce. Um, because it's not enough to produce it because then suddenly the question becomes, well, are you doing it the right way? Do you really have the knowledge to do it? Do you really have the expertise? And that it's really um, this sort of kind of one step forward, two steps back, because you're constantly having to try and legitimate uh, the validity and the value of the knowledge that's been produced because your very own identities become the basis for saying that is not legitimate research. That's not real. That's not rigorous or all these words. We've lost the Maury for a second, but hopefully um, she will be back. I We're going to, in in several minutes, open this up for uh, questions and from the rest of you so I don't get to hoard and monopolize Elaine and the Maury's time. Uh, but I will, uh, now that we have the Maury back, I'm going to ask one, I'm going to ask one more question while you're all thinking about your questions. And by the way, you can put them in the chat. You can raise your hand, you unmute, speak aloud, totally up to you. So, um, you know, I think oftentimes, you know, it's easy to get focused on the suffering and the pain and the trauma because it's all real um, and very much part of our lives and um, in our own, in very different ways for all of us um, and in the work that we do. Um, I'm curious about, you know, maybe you've had similar experiences when you're doing your research and you're just feeling inundated with trauma and violence. And it's it's even harder when it's related to like your own experience and your own family's experiences and your family's uh, trauma. Um, or it could be from witnessing, witnessing other communities, um, trauma and violence. Um, I thought, the Maury, I thought you spoke about this so beautifully this morning when you were talking about how so much shame and trauma wrapped up in caste apartheid and wrapped up in partition is really sort of shaped the capacity or incapacity of South Asian and South Asian diasporas to even like deal with these things in the first place. But I'm so curious, what are, um, how do you handle that, those experiences where you just feel so overwhelmed and so confronted by like the, the horror of, of, of your histories and your family's histories um, of colonialism, uh, of racism? What are some strategies you've used and do you have any advice um, for the rest of us to share these experiences? Um, well, I did write a book called The Trauma of Cast. And I think a big reason, and Elaine, I'm really curious if you had this experience too. But what I found was, is that I was very comfortable being an intellectual expert on the things that had wounded my people. But it was actually a much harder journey for me to be embodied in the face of the violence and confront my own grief. And I had this experience where my consciousness was like split across all of these very traumatic memories and experiences, things that I'd witnessed. And I could theorize excellently about each of them, but I had not done the work of integration. And I think if I did that work of integration, it was terrifying because, you know, my body was like split apart. You know, I had like consciousness of my abdomen, but not of my gut or my lower legs. I, um, I often felt, <clears throat> you know, even though, you know, for my work, you know, I often faced rape threats and death threats and other sorts of violence. And so 
I, I myself had panic attacks and, you know, I had to watch the worry of my family. So there's a lot where your mind is able to be a general, but your body is still a terrified child in front of that, you know? So the integration work is something that has to happen on many different dimensions. And I think for me, doing somatic abolitionist um, work with other uh, Dalit and Black Buddhists was really helpful. So Ruth King and Rhonda McGee's work was really powerful. Also incorporating methodologies from Resma Menachem, who has done a lot of work in kind of making visible experiences of supremacy systems on the body, as well as, you know, folks like Eduardo Duran, who talks about that work through the lens of intergenerational trauma. And I think all of that opened up a terrain that I explore um, that looks at the, the lens of these systems through caste stress. You know, and I talk a lot about the caste soul wound and how, you know, caste stress shows up very differently in the bodies of the oppressed versus the privileged. And I think intellectually kind of mapping that out, but then really creating my own book of where that pain lived in my body and just sometimes that empathetic witness is enough to release it. Because oftentimes we're kind of stuck in a trauma loop where we know we feel something, but we have to shove it down because it's like, we have to be professional. We have to you know, carry through on this advocacy moment, or we have to do that keynote, or we have to you know, get through that one negotiation. But afterwards we're in the bathroom crying, or we're in a place where we're compensating with other bad behaviors. And I think slowing down to the point of where you recognize what your nervous system's conditioning is, creating a space for release, and just also acknowledging that pain is part of the journey of, uh, of you know, uh, uh, taking your body and your mind and your spirit back. And, and I think that grieving with yourself, grieving with your community and grieving with the land are all ways that help you find healing. But that's why I put healing in my book because we definitely know how to like break systems down intellectually. We do not know how to put ourselves back together again. We don't know how to reassert consent in all of our domains. And part of that is because we are disjointed because we're not integrating our violence. We're theorizing about it solely. So that's some of my techniques that I've been using and I think it's been tremendous. And, um, and we, we modeled a workshop of this in Equality Labs called the Unlearning Caste Supremacy Workshop where people are learning the intellectual history of caste but also learning their conditioning and giving themselves permission to heal collectively. And that's been very, very powerful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I don't really know. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, things are really bad, right? I mean, ecologically, environmentally, politically, things are quite bad. Um, and so one, recognizing that and holding on to that and um, uh, I think acknowledging that this might take, uh, I think Tenmori's term was, you know, it's intergenerational work um, and slowing down uh, that, um, you know, there's a certain loss of control, a certain acknowledgement that uh, relationships are indeterminate, uh, but that they are also emergent. Um, so this might not be fixed or resolved in the next, you know, before the next book project or the next um, generation, but this might take, for example, in the case of forests, uh, this might take 100 years or 200 years. Uh, but we are also part of a series of resistances and our presence kind of contributes to kind of a long line of really hopeful projects. Um, so I think recognizing both the terribleness of, of you know, what, what we're in, uh, but also recognizing that there are longstanding collaborations, um, not just with other, you know, not just with other uh, people, but with um, insects and uh, plants, right? There, there are these um, co-evolving relations that... Uh, 
we can try to cultivate um, to get us to, I guess, a different space. You know, I also I am lucky to uh, be working with plants and um, and there is a lot of joy in going out to fields. You know, I, I love field work. Um, so going and working with farmers and talking about birds and, you know, rainfall, that that's incredibly, um, you know, those are incredibly joyful moments. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very, you know, thankful for that. Um, having colleagues and collaborators who, um, you know, we take care of each other and uh, recognize that um, things are changing rapidly. But, you know, for example, with the pandemic, it's, you know, one, one way of, of seeing that things can change really fast, right? The, the world shut down in a matter of one month in March 2020. Um, and so change could happen uh, rather quickly. We might not all survive, but, you know, some things will. Um, again, the temporalities are multiple and we don't kind of march along a steady and fixed route. Uh, there are many ways that we're going to get out of this um, and we might not know what those are at the moment. So I don't know is my, <laughs> my, my, my short answer. Thank you for both of those um, honest and vulnerable answers. I, I would I, I always like to think of um, Mary Amakaba saying that hope is a discipline and try to try to practice that. Um, yeah. Since I am monopolizing the two of you, I do want to see, do we have any questions from our attendees? So far, I haven't seen anything in the chat. I will keep going. <laughs> I can ask a question. Thank you, please, Taylor. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to word this. Um, I guess like throughout your careers, um, have there been times where you haven't felt supported within the work that you were doing, and what does that support look like? What can people within the DH community or those with privilege within their identity, you know, allyship, what could that look like to support and to uplift the work that you guys are currently doing? Um, oh my gosh, yes. I don't think there's anyone who's a BIPOC scholar who can say that our life was like a, a life filled with support and care um, from the institutions we're a part of. Absolutely not. Um, but I think that what is really interesting is that just like in the pandemic, where mutual aid was really crucial to support communities where systemic breakdowns occurred, I think you see the same thing in institutions like universities, is that there might be widespread erasure and bigotry and violence, but usually other BIPOC feminist scholars, some who might be tenured, some who are, you know, um, adjunct or even graduate students, people will find you. Um, especially if you are that squeaky wheel that demands grease to say, help me, people will find you and help you. And that's what happened to me because so many, you know, as someone who works on cast, I wanted, I came to university to study cast. And the South Asian Studies Department at UC Berkeley said definitively, cast is not an important access to study South Asia. No scholar there would, you know, supervise my research. And they said, don't study cast, study class. And they said, there's not really a significant Dalit leader that has ever come out of South Asian studies to, to really study. So this is the wrong tree that you're barking up. And it was nonsense. And I think that, you know, I think it's a credit to every BIPOC scholar who faces that you don't take their, their epistemic violence against you um, to accept their attempt to erase you, you fight back. And you fight back with your mind and your body and your spirit and the mutual aid of relationships that form around knowledge making that other intersectional feminist scholars have had to build to carve their way. And so I was really mentored deeply by scholars that came from 
the Women of Color Resource Center. There's many Black Panther feminist elders that are in Oakland because I went to Berkeley and they're there. And, you know, wild things like the fact that 70% of the Black Panthers were women were so, you know, those facts and meeting some of those leaders were so powerful. And that gave me a lot of strength. And, it, and it's funny because when you're doing your own work, you're so kind of tied into your like experience and like how that needs to be theorized. But I always remember being on a panel with Patricia Hill, Hill Collins and it was myself and a Roma feminist. And, um, you know, and she was like, you know, when we, when I wrote my book, I really thought it was just for black queer feminists. That's it. Never in my wildest dreams did I understand that our intersectional, you know, articulation as black queer feminist scholars would lead to Roma and Dalit women interacting and finding themselves in my work. So the mutual aid that initially begins with helping you kind of enter the academy ends up being a web of collective power and knowledge making because we're basically out theorizing white supremacy and Brahminism and the colonialism that has resulted in us being dispossessed. So when we recreate webs of knowledge with each other, we heal ourselves in a way that's very deeply profound. Yeah, I agree with with you know all of that. Um, I mean, discrimination is very real, and it will break your heart, and it will tear you down. Um, uh, you know, but as Tenmori said, you know, there's there's a web of uh, support. Um, Maybe something I can add to that is to say it's important to speak up um, because it makes that web stronger. Uh, I think with Black Lives Matter and the pandemic, you know, what's happened, I think, in the last four or five years is really astounding, right? There's been a big shift, I think, in academia as well as the arts. Um, BIPOC, trans, queer, uh, a lot of um, lives that have been marginalized and dispossessed for, for a long, long time. So, you know, you see it in Q&As and academic talks and, the, you know, usually the people who get to speak are not people who look like me or not people who look like us here. Um, so discrimination is very real, but um, speaking up and you know, being counted, I think counts for a lot because it might support um, someone down the line in the next, you know, few years. So again, kind of extending the temporalities of resistance, um, claiming your spaces. Uh, I think there is there is always that web, uh, but again, I think maybe the only thing I wanted to add is um, to be part of it, right? To go out and, um, uh, acknowledge that there are multiple pathways to uh, making things different and not just making things different, but right, because they could be worse, but, you know, making making things actually the world you want to live in. And that means not agreeing um, to things that are happening around us. Uh, it's a struggle. And that means, um, I mean, all of us here in the room might want a better world, but we have different definitions of that. Um, and I think the support comes from understanding that we're going to be very different, um, but that we can respect those differences and allow for spaces um, where we can disagree and not kill each other, right? Where we can actually talk things through. Um, I, I don't know, it's the start of maybe new kinds of polities uh, that are built on difference um, where that does not end up in standardization or homo homogenization, uh, but ends up in like a pluriverse, right? I think that that would be you know, remarkable. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly say that I was not being gratuitous or disingenuous when I said that there was a time in digital humanities where a space like this could not have been imagined or dreamed of. And it was, I mean, 
and I'm talking about a decade ago, I'm not even talking about a long time ago, right? Um, those of us who sort of were trying to, you know, who who identified as digital humanists in terms of our, our you know, field, who were trying to make space for a conversation like this, um, faced a level, yes, Anne uh, Kangyan was there too, uh, so were a number of people here. Um, you would just, it's hard to, it's hard to think about, it's kind of actually traumatic to think about that something that seems so basic as we need to talk about race, we need to talk about colonialism, would have been greeted by such a level of dismissal and vitriol and outright sort of delegitimation of, of our work. And so things can really can change. And we all, um, in, in addition to what the Maury and Elaine have said in terms of their strategies, all of those resonate with me. And for me, it's also um, been about finding the place where I can insert myself into existing structures that can be repurposed uh, for for better ends. And so like one, my classic example is I got elected to the Association for Computers and Humanities um, Executive Council in 2014. I have no idea how, but it worked. And I immediately got on the nominations committee and I stacked that with so many people of color that it was statistically improbable to not elect at least one or two of us, two, uh, two more of my colleagues got elected the second year. And then we read the whole organization. I mean, now, I mean, we just, I, tomorrow we'll announce our new, our new slate and our new um, elected officials. And, you know, it's just really tremendous to see. I was the first person of color elected to this organization's board. That is this organization exists in the seventies. And, you know, and now I'm its president with Quinn Dombrowski, who's my co-president. And so, I mean, it's, I chose organizational institutional work as one strategy and my research as a strategy. And we all have to find the places that we feel like our intervention is most, um, is going to be most, most useful. And that answer looks different for all of us. Um, but the change really can happen in digital humanities, for sure. Um, I do want to see, and uh, we have time for one more question if there's anybody who has one. Oh, Taylor has a wonderful comment. And Kristen's dog agrees. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you. And as women of color, it's not easy to open those doors, but you're opening doors for so many young women and other folks in marginalized communities come after you and with privilege or not that's important and it's also just really inspiring and thank you all again oh yeah and you know the one thing i would also offer you is that always ask you know take people out to coffee and you know someone told me that as a young you know when i was a young scholar and um, I was so shy and I thought it was really embarrassing. And I was like, who would take the time to meet with me? But that's one of the things that, you know, if you have someone who's like path you really respect or your work you really like, email them, say, you know, people can oftentimes can't give you an hour, but they usually can give you 15 minutes to a half hour if it's like for a digital coffee. And everyone that has gotten into a place of power um, usually will take up some level of a mentorship conversation, even if it's that session or some people formally take mentors, you know, get your mentors lined up so you can see the path that's right for you because everyone has a very untraditional path, you know, as you'll see from the different people that have spoken here. And there are people that want to help and we are stronger when we're intergenerationally um, connected. So just want to encourage you in that way as well. That's amazing. And I would just say also, don't discount that your peers are amazing mentors too. I mean, Anne is one of that and Kung Yang Hien is here is one of them. Um, but if it not been for my my peers, I'm not sure what I'd be doing with my life right now, but it's probably not this. <laughs> well, thank you so much to all of you for being here. Elaine, Thamori, thank you for the honor of having this conversation and getting to talk to you. I've known about your work, um, watched and admired your work from afar for a long time. And I'm really, really grateful to have had this opportunity. So thank you so much. <laughs>